this project for three plus years. Started working in the lab the summer after his grad year. Um, he came in, he, he chose this topic, Anyone Who Wonders, his name, and I'd like to work on this one. This will involve cat feces. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> So the um, title of my presentation is an analysis of Toxoplanus megondii diversity in stray and pet cats in Rockbridge County, Virginia. It's in my title since the beginning. So we uh, we realize now that this project has turned into some other things as well as just simply an analysis of the genetic diversity of Toxoplasma. So what is Toxoplasma gondii? It has nothing to do with Gandhi. <laughs> but it is a single cell parasitic protist. Um, and why you should care about it is it's the causative uh, agent of the disease toxoplasmosis, which usually, you know, if you have a functioning immune system, you're fine, you don't have to worry about this, except sometimes it can cause ocular toxoplasmosis. Um, however, toxoplasmosis has historically been a huge danger to people with compromised immune systems such as you know, uh, advanced stage AIDS patients or people with on immunosuppressants like transplant recipients, as well as it uh, poses a congenital threat. Mothers who are infected with toxoplasma for the first time um, while pregnant, their children, uh, the effects can range from fetal blindness to death. So it really is um, a significant and going public health concern. Um, especially when it comes to maternal and uh, sort of uh, pregnancy health as well as the immunocompromised. And it has a distinctive life cycle. Uh, its definitive hosts are cats, which means it reproduces in the cat, but it can infect pretty much anything warm-blooded. In fact, it can even infect um, avian birds. So it's extremely versatile. Um, and its life cycle starts in the tachyphilite phase um, when you're newly infected with Toxoplasma gondii, tachyphilites sort of spread throughout the body and establish these, tis these tissue cysts and become what are known as bradyphilites in um, the body of their, their host animal. And unless you're a cat, these tissue cysts will just sort of lie dormant. They're gonna be there, but they're not, unless you, know, uh, you have one of the conditions mentioned before, they're not going to uh, really affect you and they're not going to uh, spread and you can't spread them on um, uh, conventionally. However, in cats, they take up residence in the small intestine and epithelial cells there, reproduce and are excreted as oocysts um, and go on to infect the environment of uh, future generations of cats. So uh, you can get infected from any animal if you consume the tissue cysts. So one source of toxoplasma is uh, undercooked meat just coming in contact with it, uh, with tissue cysts uh, containing material. And it's, uh, it's estimated that about the third of the world's adult population has a uh, toxoplasma infection. Um, but obviously for most people, <coughs> it stays um, asymptomatic. And uh, what we know about sort of the genetic diversity of it already is that it's uh, because it's sort of and most of its reproduction, at least in North America and Europe, is clonal, meaning it, it fertilizes itself uh, in its sexual stage of reproduction. Um, you get these big clonal lineages, uh, types one, two, and three uh, are the main ones in Europe and North America. In South America, and increasingly the literature has shown Africa, it's far more diverse, it's sort of a free-for-all down there. Um, but this is important for us from a public health standpoint because um, some, stain, some strains, some lineages are more important for public health than others, such as in North America, most toxoplasmosis cases come from uh, toxoplasma uh, organisms that belong to the, um, to the type two lineage. 
So it's, it's important to know what we have, and I'll, I'll get into that here in a second. So what sparked my interest really in this is in Rockford County, Colonel Lilly's past research along with uh, Caroline Wortham was that uh, in a study where Rockford County capped for samples, um, Rockford County co uh, compared to about 20 different global sampling sites had sort of a comparatively astronomical level of toxoplasma infection. We were seeing probably, um, I believe, you know, the most, if not one of the, the top three most, um, most infected cat populations. And that's a, a cause for concern because um, one, you know, it is an important pathogen. And two, we just kind of want to figure out what's going on, why Rockford County. So that, that sort of spurred my interest in the project here. Um, so it's, it's very much a, a going concern and not, you know, simply it, it's working with what we have, but it's not, you know, it's, Rockford County isn't a random place. In fact, the literature shows that this is a very interesting, very promising place for toxoplasma research. And so our, uh, my hypothesis going into this project was that uh, we would probably, so with a globally high level, we could have two, uh, two possibilities genetic diversity wise. One would be that we just have an outbreak of one sort of highly clonal sort of single strain or single lineage group, or that we could have a large number of different types, different lineages of toxoplasma in the county. Um, and so the way I wanted to test that was that we would sample pet versus stray cat, and it was assumed that stray cats would have, if if this was a uh, if this was a, a sort of multi lineage um, multi lineage problem, that stray cats would have more lineages present uh, versus pet cats because of greater environmental exposure. So. My methods, I started this summer of 2016, um, and we started with a goal of about 50 samples, approximately equal proportions of pet and stray. And we got these from uh, three or from four areas. We got them from the Blue Ridge Animal Clinic, Animal Clinic of Rockbridge, Cats Unlimited, which is a uh, sort of a uh, stray uh, cat rescue organization, and then the Rockbridge SPCA. So I went around and have gone around for a couple summers uh, introducing myself at the front desk of SPCA's and veterinary clinics as the cat food guy. So uh, it was a, it's been a, a learning experience, definitely very humbling. And this is just an example of one of the sample tubes uh, that we would use. Uh, you can put the date on there, age of cat if we knew it, pet or stray, um, and then we didn't really use the indoor, outdoor, or both functionality just because for a lot of these animals, um, just you couldn't get too much information if they were strays, obviously, and even veterinary clinics, you know, unless you call up every individual pet owner, it would just be extremely laborious to get a full life history on these cats. Um, and so we did DNA extraction, uh, fecal DNA extraction using a modified um, repeated bee feeding uh, plus Cobb technique, and um, populate, uh, first published by Ewan Morrison. Um, and so what we did was we would get uh, a buffer and silica beads, so little sort of glass-like beads, and put them together with fecal tissue, and pretty much use, uh, use this really cool uh, machine right here just to really shake them up so that we would manually uh, sort of light the, uh, light the cells. It was sort of like a little shotgun in a plastic tube. Really cool. Um, and then we would purify them through a series of uh, buffer treatments, uh, precipitation, ammonia acetate to get proteins out. So um, it was a pretty, it's a pretty involved process, I'd say, to get, uh, D to purify DNA from fecal samples, um, just because there is so much stuff to purify out. And as I'll tell you later, we ran into some problems with sort of the durability of the samples over time. And then we would confirm using uh, spectro photometry on this little machine right here. So it would pretty much show us a curve. Uh, and if it looked like DNA, good job. If it didn't look like DNA, we would try again. So 
lot of trying to get throughout the entire project. <clears throat> and so our main our main sort of research method throughout this was polymerase chain reaction or PCR. For those of you who don't know what PCR is, pretty much you uh, you use a set of primers uh, to select a portion of DNA that you want out of out of a lot of DNA. So going into this, you know, you purify the DNA from the fecal sample, but then you really have um, you have DNA from bacteria, just cat cells. So these primers are little little strips of DNA that uh, specify uh, the one gene that you specify so that we wanted to amplify, and then you run it through a series of treatments um, using heat and uh, proteins, DNA polymerases, to uh, replicate this uh, this DNA. So you start with you know a tiny amount of uh, toxoplasmic DNA, and after this treatment, you have exponentially more. So it's it's a very uh, useful technique. And for this uh, for this project, we used real time PCR as well as regular PCR. And real time PCR is good in that it uh, it uses uh, elements of uh, spectrometry to uh, or spectroscopy to give more uh, information than you would get from average PCR. So you can use it depending on um, sort of the, the uh, spectroscopy data. You can see where um, sort of different concentrations, when you get things, um, and even what kind of things that you get to help us out. And this is. Um, just an example of a standard curve I ran. So this is using sort of known toxoplasma DNA that we ordered. And so you have the fluorescence, which is pretty much showing how much of the thing you have or if you have the thing. Um, and then the x-axis is the number of cycles, so the number of sort of <coughs> that we used on real-time PCR. And so if you, this blue, uh, this blue line is our uh, most concentrated positive control, um, and you can see that because it takes, you know, less cycles than the rest to reach the, the positive threshold on the machine. And for this project, we used uh, primers for SAG1, which is a uh, surface antigen gene on toxoplasma, so it's one of the ones um, that your immune system sort of keys in on, and because of that, toxoplasma is always sort of altering it, trying to get it, uh, always altering it to stay one step ahead of host defenses. Um, and because of that, it's really good for assessing genetic diversity because it changes so frequently. There's some genes that, you know, barely change at all, and if you look at those, um, you're just going to say, well, oh, these are all the same thing, but if you use one of one of the more more variable genes, you're going to get a uh, sort of just a better picture of actual change throughout time. And then we confirmed our products using gel electrophoresis. So um, you can get your PCR <coughs> products and you run them on an algorithm gel, and it separates it separates your product from PCR by size. And one, it, it shows you. Um, what you've got, and two, it also helps purify things. So we were looking for uh, for bands that were between, you know, about 150 to 100 base pairs, and these, uh, and so you sort of this top row of bands right here is what we were looking for. I'll get into that, and then it it helps purify it out from sort of smaller junk fragments, little remnants of the PCR process you don't necessarily want, but just kind of leftovers. And then we extracted some from the gel using a, a chiogen kit, the kit that we ordered, um, and sent them out to be sequenced. And so one of our first analysis tools we used for this project was melt curve analysis. So different DNA strands are made up of uh, different proportions of base pairs, you know, A pairs with P, C pairs with G, and um, A pairing with P, you have two hydrogen bonds, C pairing with G, you have three. So actually, if something has a, say, a higher proportion of C and G than another sample, it will allow you 
to, to tell, find sort of the temperature in PCR at which uh, the two strands of DNA separate, it actually makes an observable difference, which is pretty cool. So we were able, what we were hoping to use this for was to see, you know, if we if there was variation, we expected to see, you know, different temperatures at which sort of um, at which the samples, when you looked at the uh, the, the real time PCR data, at which they dissociated. And so this is a melt curve analysis from or a melt curve from our uh, one of our known controls. Uh, that we ordered from the American Type Culture Collection. And as you can see, it peaks round about 85. And uh, that just tells you that, uh, and that it's, uh, if you see this in a, in a group of, uh, in a group of strains, it, it tells you, you know, this is a distinct thing. <clears throat> and so this is, actually one of the assays that we got back using our samples. So as you see, we have that sort of 85 peak. We also have peaks out here around 89, some at 87, uh, some at uh, 82, 83-ish. So that just gives you an example of um, how we actually use this. And because of this, we looked at this and we saw there are about four groups of peaks. So our, our initial thinking is, um, you know that these represent four distinct strains or four distinct toxoplasma SAG1 uh, amplification products, showing that there, there's possibly four different strains um, in the cats that we found. So I, I named these, this was from my initial research, I named these uh, strains A, B, A, B, C, and D, just pretty simple, uh, going in terms of increase in melt temperature. And so uh, this is a graph of the total percentage of possible strains in all cats. Uh, and uh, so it just shows the most cat or uh, the most like popular strain was B, um, followed by B, C, and then A. Then we broke it down um, just into a, a smaller percentage of uh, sort of we broke it down into two groups, pets versus strays. And D was uh, still the most popular type in pets, while C was sort of the most popular uh, type in strays. But you had, uh, you usually had multiple strains. So you would get, uh, we had about 10, 11 cats with only one. And then um, quite a few that had two, three, four, different strains, so we, we were seeing that um, initially this looked like it sort of uh, supported our hypothesis that we were seeing multiple strains in cats. And um, there was no, contrary to sort of our hypothesis, this initial data showed that there wasn't any real difference in, uh, in the number of strains in pets versus strays. We ran a, a t-test on this and uh, the p-value was 0.32, which isn't significant. So um, what we thought, we would have thought that, you know, because uh, strays were more exposed to the environment, they would have more strains, but that didn't appear to be the case. One, uh, one possible rationale for that, um, we thought, is that in Rockbridge County, you know, you don't have a whole lot of cat breeders, you know, so if you're picking up a pet cat, you're probably picking up one from a shelter or a rescue. Um, so they've probably been uh, exposed to more strains in the wild. So it would be it would be an interesting follow-up study to do this with, you know, cats that were you know uh, bred to, instead of just rescued. But we did find that uh, pets and strays had a significantly different um, distribution of uh, of strains. So uh, as you can see, strays had had more A, um, and uh, so the, while uh, pets had significantly less. So really, uh, comparing these two, you see that there's a proportionally there's a different distribution in strains um, in strains in uh, strays versus pets, which shows that while the number didn't really differ, you do 
you had the idea that maybe there's something circulating in the, uh, the prey population that hadn't, hasn't made its way over to the pet population yet, which uh, would probably be this, this strain A right here that's um, disproportionately represented in the uh, stray cat population. And then we did find that strays were more likely than cats to have toxoplasma. Um, this wasn't I mean, given our original hypothesis with greater environmental uh, exposure, this wasn't, you know, unexpected, but it was good to have actual confirmation of that. But we did find that pets had more toxoplasma oocysts. Uh, in this graph, uh, the TQ, um, actually the lower the y-axis is, the more it has because it's going off real-time PCR data. Um, so strays, it took on average more runs of PCR to get positive hits, whereas with pets we had less, which shows us that something about pet cats shows that you know you have more of it in them than strays do. And then we set it out for sequencing. This is just a uh, this is just a um, an illustration of our sequence results. You get uh, C A C T T, and then for uh, those spaces that they couldn't sequence, you just get N. And then we uh, we ran our results from the uh, from the gel uh, extractions into the NIH's BLAST database, which showed us what we really had. And these the samples that we've been sequencing are different from the samples that we started out with because over time um, we discovered last summer that these fecal samples, we were storing them, um, and there are a lot of DNA degrading enzymes in with them, so the samples became essentially unusable after about two years, which was a pain, so we sort of had to start from uh, from square one, but we started to get some, some good data from that. Um, and this sequence actually, it's, a, it's an alignment from uh, something that we put in, we found it, and we've, uh, we found that we got a lot of hits for Bifidobacterium longum, which is a common gut bacteria, instead of Toxoplasma. So our thinking is these, these SAG1 primers are supposed to be highly specific for Toxoplasma. They just amplify that. But they're also amplifying common uh, gut bacteria. And so we uh, successfully sequenced uh, seven samples after last summer's uh, DNA degradation fiasco, but um, but we found of those seven samples, all had all samples had one band in the 150 to 100 base pair region. Um, but we found that uh, you know some of those bands, what I call the L bands, the lighter bands, it moved forward more and then the H bands, and uh, when we cut these out and sequenced them, we found that the L bands were actually this Bifidobacterium longum, this common gut bacteria, whereas the H bands were actually uh, Toxoplasma. And so this uh, poses a problem for our real-time PCR results as well, because we're seeing that maybe we got false positives on those that weren't Toxoplasma at all. They were this Bifidobacterium. Um, and so that's a, a novel, a novel finding because these these primers are in pretty common use, and if they're not as specific as they say they are, then that's a problem, and uh, that's one of our uh, one of our findings. And then our sequences were of less than ideal quality, so we've we've uh, we've been able to uh, to blast them, to align them, to figure out what they are, but they're not as of high quality as we would hope, just given the nature of gel extraction, you get pretty low quality DNA extracts out of that. <clears throat> and so, as I said, the, uh, cons the consistent application of uh, amplification of bifidobacterium by these primers is a problem because they're supposed to be specific and they aren't. Um, and this might explain a false positive issue raised by Colonel Lilly and Caroline Wortham back in 2013. Um, that show that upon sequencing of a lot of positive results, you had a huge rate of false positives. Um, and so this might go further to explain the why of it. And um, 
So really our next steps uh, that I'm hoping to finish up in the next week or so here, we have enough pieces pretty much written, but uh, if, I ha if it's possible, I would like to do some more sequencing. I have some samples um, that are ready to go. And, uh, and then just cross check those with the identification or with the real time PCR data. So possibly we can identify whether one or several of those peaks are this bifidobacterium organism so we can go around and say, you know, well, we'll exclude these and just try to make some more sense of the data. All right, for my acknowledgements, I would like to acknowledge Colonel Lilly, um, who's been my mentor throughout this, uh, David Pody and Callum Wallace, who are my, uh, who are my lab partners the, uh, the first year I was here, uh, Julie Lozier, the lab tech at the biology department, who's been really my go-to person on all problems of uh, molecular biology. And then Isaiah Donio and Jen Bailey, who worked with me last summer, and I, I, I mentored them and got some, uh, got some free labor out of them. I'd also <laughs> like to 